Welcome to our dialogue, Storytelling with Art and Technology. And yeah, we're here with three amazing speakers. Um, we have Eames Demetrius, who's been working with us at Jaga for since when? I don't, I don't even know when, Eames. <laughs> Definitely, we started these conversations in 2017, but probably the first conversation was much earlier. Mm -hmm. So, welcome, Eames. We have Jack Hardiker um, from the UK. Welcome, Jack. Thank you very uh, much. Mm -hmm. Gayatri from the Chennai Photo Biennale, who's Hi. going to help us moderate today's session. So, welcome, Gayatri. <laughs> So a big shout out to uh, Eames and the Chimeric Sphere team. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the project that we are engaged in, which is the context for today's conversation. But um, so yeah, thank you for supporting the dialogue and the fun that we're having beyond a bit. A big shout out to British Council, who's also supporting this uh, dialogue. They've been longtime supporters of Jaga and especially Dara. Uh, Dara, of course, is, and this is a Dara event as well. Dara is started by Archana Prasad, who is the mother of Jaga and Be Fantastic and, and Dara. We're really sad to not have her here today. She's going through some health issues, but we fondly think of her and miss her. Um, and partners, Dara, Jaga, and Be Fantastic. Of course, we're all, a same, we're all part of the same mothership, the same family. Uh, we're just beginning to do very different things. So both Be Fantastic and Dara have been incubated under Jaga for the last few years. And now we've spun off to do our uh, kind of go intense into the things that we do. So the context that brings us all together is flyover country. And flyover country is a primary sphere project in collaboration with Jaga and Be Fantastic, where we have been really excited to bring Eames's global storytelling, three-dimensional storytelling project to Bangalore under a flyover. I think it all started with a conversation between Eames and Archana, where Eames was dreaming about a flyover for his parallel universe story. And Archana was, oh, we at Jaga have uh, access to five and now 14 flyovers. <laughs> Um, so Jaga has been part of, been working under flyovers since 2014, uh, trying to really use our brains to see how, how creative practice can manifest in some of Bangalore's most derelict public spaces. So that's really been our journey since 2017. The aim was not to conquer every flyover, but to really work with the local community and the artists and bring forth something relevant to both uh, parties. So we can move on. And Flyover Country itself has been an amazing journey, uh, starting with an open call. Manan, next slide. Uh, starting with an open call, we have 11 amazing artists in the room, three mentors, all Bangalore-based, who have been really grappling with Eames' is parallel universe and trying to be the mediators, the creative mediators between the story and the public. Are we stuck, Manan? I think there is some electricity issue at Manan's place. Or oh, can you please okay. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, Nikita, you were saying electricity is going crazy all over the country. Internet has been bad throughout the day. This is like I've attended three sort of sessions and all three have faced the same. Okay, let me see if this does the trick. Are you there? Can everybody see? Yes. Oh, but I, I'm sorry, I didn't share for sound. So I need to do this again. After all those tech checks that we did. 
optimize for video, share sound. Oh, now did I share the wrong one? Can you, yes. can somebody tell me what you're seeing? We can see your entire desktop. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, now we should be okay. All fine? Can we see wait, the screen? We We're waiting, can't see yeah. anything yet. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Now we can okay. see. Sorry for that interruption. Um, yeah, so we had a room full of amazing creative energy for, we started in the beginning of July and here we are so many weeks later with a lot of work that's happened. And we're hoping to manifest something like this. Of course, this looks really pristine for an Indian urban space, but this is one of the first few <laughs> renderings uh, of bringing creative practice the world of Thymeric Sphere and this particular world of flyover country to Bangalore streets. And here's a little, um, yeah, video to give you a sense of what happened. My name is Eames Demetrius. I'm the geographer at large for Chimeric Sphere, which is a global work of multidimensional storytelling. Chimeric Sphere? Chimeric Sphere? See, it's just like it's written. It's very simple. It's very simple. Chimeric there. There are like, for example, a lot of stories which are happening in parallel. Each of the elements you see here is going up and down the world within this world. Oh, yara ye hai ya mele ki padavan vidhi tu kondo. Bahya kasha matu perilim mula ka ali ke hari ho daga. Samoha. What does the image on site create? What sensation of place does it create? And the biggest takeaway has been the realization of seeing uh, technology itself as art. So that's a sense of what happened um, just very quickly. Kamya, um, yeah, we can see a gray bar at the bottom. I don't know why. So you okay. didn't see the video? I guess no, we could see it. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, so that's really some of the, a uh, really brief, I don't want to take up too much of everybody's time. We have uh, a lot of fun to be had here, but that was a brief of what happened. Uh, just to let everybody here know that we are going to have a showcasing of the work that we've done on the 5th of October. Uh, we are hoping for it to be a more intimate gathering um, and so for all of you who have taken the time to be here we offer it to you please email us and Manan if you can put the email on the chat right now please give us a quick email that you'd like to be in for the October 5th uh, showcase and we'll have you invited in for it so um, with that I will introduce Gayatri, who is our moderator for today. Um, Gayatri is the founding trustee and the director of education for the Chennai Photo Biennale Foundation. She heads pro uh, the children's programming, which includes conducting photography workshops, bringing in arts curriculum and creating a community of young artists learners and photographers. So Gayatri, thanks for agreeing to journey with us and take it away, I hand over the mic to you. Thank you, Kamya. Um, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yes, okay, I'm gonna share my screen and remember to share audio at the same time. Share sound. Okay. Is this, uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So good evening and good afternoon and morning, everyone. I'm Gayatri. And as Kamya said, I'm one of the co-founders of the Chennai Photo Banana Foundation. Oh. Um, thank you. Be fantastic, Jaga, Dara, for inviting me for this conversation. Um, I, I'll try to keep this um, brief. So um, someone's keeping check on time. Um, I'll start my presentation 
uh, with a story since I think the theme of our talk, you know, dialogue today is storytelling with the story of uh, Fauna of Mirrors. Uh, Fauna of Mirrors was the theme of the last edition of Chennai Photo Biennale, which was curated by um, a Bangalore based artist, Pushpamala N. So this is an excerpt from an interview that Pushpamala uh, gave before the Biennale. The theme for the Biennale was based um, on this ancient Chinese myth called Fauna of Mirrors. This is a myth, that, there's a, in this myth, there's a belief that there's an alternate universe that exists behind the mirror, which is like a parallel world to the real world. Pushpamala based her argument on photography um, around this concept, that photography actually creates a parallel world that is not really a reflection of the real world as you think it is. It's a very strange world. And this is one of the works of the artists that we had exhibited in the Biennale. And she sees photography as this premier medium of, modern, of the modern age. Uh, ever since industrialization, it's been recording modern life. Sorry, I'm just getting a call. Um, it's been recording on life, but there is a hegemony. It's as if a part of the world has a history, has a modernity, and other parts of the world do not have a history or a modern history. So the archive has become very important. And the archive is seen as a very political thing. It's a way of stating that you also exist. So you can see the rest of this um, interview on our YouTube channel. Um, I'm just gonna quickly show you a, a 90 minute, 90 second clip, sorry. 90 second clip of our last festival here in Chennai. And I hope the sound works. And then we can. So that was uh, Chennai Photo Banale's second edition, but actually um, gearing up to our third edition later on this year, and I'll tell you more about it. Um, so one of the highlights of um, CPB, well, at least the last edition pre-COVID, was that we were using heritage, forgotten buildings and spaces that people normally do not have access to, um, like this building here called the Senate House, um, which is located inside the University of Madras. We were trying to make the Biennale as accessible as possible. Chennai as a city also doesn't have a lot of, like most, uh, I guess, big cities in India, doesn't have a lot of public art spaces. Um, so we tried to make use of what was available, um, like these buildings, but also public spaces, like the beach. So the beach is a very important public space in Chennai. We did uh, evening projections of photography. Uh, it was one of our most accessible um, exhibits. We also, um, in our first edition, hosted exhibitions in the park um, where, you know, you have your evening joggers and, um, um, you know, aunties gossiping and children playing and all sorts of, you know, things happening alongside the exhibitions and in train stations where people are going um, to, to their workplace or, you know, going to meet someone. So they would pass by um, exhibitions. In addition, Pushpamala also curated a conference on photography, which was I think for India, one of the first few spaces where we were talking about everything from the Anthropocene to social media, surveillance, citizenship photography, um, artificial intelligence, uh, and non photography. Everything was discussed in this conference. Um, again, a lot of these conversations are available for you to see. Um, a, a little bit of the challenges we faced in the Biennale. Um, since we don't have traditional exhibition spaces, we had to um, innovate, we had to you know, create spaces, frames, structures, 
uh, innovate new ways of exhibiting photography because normally it is exhibited on walls. Um, and uh, in some cases we had to add lighting, electricity, security. So it was a pretty intensive affair um, to do this for 30 days across the city of Chennai over um, several venues. That was a peek into our last test. And the foundation actually has been doing much more um, in the last few years that we've been around. We wanted to build a strong base here in Chennai and in India to build a strong community of you know, um, not just photographers, but art lovers, contemporary art lovers. So we expanded the scope of what we do, um, uh, both in person and virtually. And the Biennale basically grew two new arms or wings. Uh, one is called the Learning Lab and one is called PRISM. The Learning Lab curates programs throughout the year for artists um, and also collaborates with other institutes on art and culture events. Prism, which is what I think we chatted a lot about yesterday for those of you who were there on the Dara chat, um, is our educational wing where we work with, um, with young children in schools. Um, and once COVID started, we were doing a lot of programs uh, virtually as well. Um, we also had children from outside Chennai um, now joining in. Um, but I'll just highlight one project that we did sort of this year. Um, um, and this was, I think, a response to the conversation around art and tech. You know, a lot of us see tech as, uh, I guess, the new technologies and digital tech. But um, um, Varun, uh, one of the co-founders, is he's uh, really uh, passionate about analog photography. And I, I see this also as a printing technology. And, uh, you know, I think there's been this sort of movement across the world to revive certain older ways of doing things. And um, we've actually, you know, we've done workshops this year. Uh, we've created some products that people can pick up and, you know, do Sinotype at home. We've got an e-learning model. This is something that we've worked on this year as a way to kind of revive this movement in Chennai. And actually we're having an exhibition at, in this month for World Sinotype Day. Again, I already mentioned about PRISM, uh, which is um, our student program. Um, when it comes to tech and art, uh, with young children um, in India, especially even now, um, the access to uh, digital tech is is not what it is in most, I guess, um, um, richer countries. Um, most students are sharing the device with parents or with siblings, and access to virtual classes was quite challenging. So we spent a better part of this year and last year trying to get them that access. Um, the other challenge was then having access to bandwidth. And the Wi-Fi, which again um, is not something that every child has, so we started working on creating asynchronous learning, you know, things that we could send on WhatsApp and other messaging services, so that students could work on in their own time. Um, I'm uh, sorry, this is autoplayed. Um, yeah, so giving them these gadgets and working with tech, I think, also meant that we had to give them chances to engage with it thoughtfully. Um, um, because a lot of them are quite young, they're like eight and nine years old. So this year we hosted a residential photography camp for children in a theater space. And I think um, uh, for us, we've expanded the way we approach photography teaching also we, because children learn not just in ways. So we've tried to incorporate a storytelling, um, theater, music, etc., into our photography classes. So we collaborated with a theater space in Kovil Patti in Tamil Nadu. And, um, Here's a, just a short clip of um, uh, Murga Bhupati, who was the playwright, who was sort of like our host. And uh, um, this is what he had to say about the workshop. Let's see if it plays. Updating the media, updating the culture, updating the cell phone and laptop, all of us, 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 all of அப்படிங்கிறதுக்கான ஒரு தோக்கமாக இந்த ஃபோட்டோகிராஃபி ஒர்க் ஷாப் வந்து இன்னைக்கு இந்த நாலு நாள் நடந்துருக்கு யா ஸோ வி ட்ரை டு மேக் ஷோர் தட் யூனோ சில்ட்ரன் ரியலி ஹாவ் அ சான்ஸ் டு டு என்கேஜ் வித் இட் பட் லிட்டில் பிட் தாட்ஃபுல்லி um coming up to the i know we have 3 minutes left so coming up to our next edition which is in december it's going to be primarily a hybrid ally with most of it being on a on a web based uh, i mean a website that we are currently building to make it as immersive as possible um covid permitting and uh funding permitting we'd like to have uh you know neighborhood public interventions where there's not so much of contact in, or having to go somewhere to see a show 
Uh, so you could kind of just, you know, walk into your neighborhood's um, um, exhibition. We're also planning a little publication that we can distribute. Um, and there possibly will be some virtual programming as well. Um, do I have a little bit more time? I just wanted to show one quick video. Yeah, Can't you have two minutes. Two okay, minutes. okay, perfect. So this is exactly right. I have two minutes. I just want to show you our um, our theme for next for this upcoming year, um, which is Maps of Disquiet. It's just a short film, and after that, I'm going to introduce themes to you. Okay, so that was the Maps of Disquiet, which is coming up uh, later on this year. We hope you all will make it virtually. Um, and um, I will now introduce our first speaker, Eames. Um, Eames uh, Dimitrios wears many hats, exploring film, art, design, and storytelling, each rewarding in their own way. His current large scale art project is his parallel universe, Chimeric Sphere. I learned that over one week. A global work of multivalent storytelling, telling stories through the physicality of the world. Today, there are 142.5 long term installations in 30 linear countries, with more constantly in development. The 0.5 is ready to go for the moon. Petrios is the director of the Eames office, founded by Charles and Ray Eames, and has devoted decades to communicating the Eames's holistic vision of design to the world at large. He also works with Herman Miller and Vitra to properly make the Eames furniture, as well as participates in the development of important exhibitions, like the one at the Barbican Gallery in London. Demetrios has given talks in 51 countries on six continents. Frequent topics include his own work, scale, the design of Charles and Ray Eames, and simply delivering good old fashioned storytelling. He's a filmmaker as well, having made about 75 films. Demetrios was instrumental in creating the interactive version of the Eames groundbreaking film, Powers of Ten, which I recommend everybody watch. It's on YouTube. I checked it out. Uh, I think I might have seen it as a child, but anyway, it was still amazing to watch again. I must admit that when I was first speaking to Eames last week, I didn't know what to expect. I had never heard of chimerics here before either. Surely I'm not alone in thinking what kind of person dedicates his whole life to creating a parallel universe and then goes on, then goes around the world to install these amazingly complex, bizarre and fantastical stories in bronze and stone in 142 places, including the moon. But after jumping into this universe, I'm thrilled to say that the last week of my life has been one of imagination and curiosity. I urge you all to explore this world too. Uh, thank you, Eames, for being with us. Over to you. Thank you very much. Let's see, let me get... Um, so, <clears throat> we got... All right, so I'm gonna... Um, are, is, uh, are you able to hear me and see me? Just wanted to be, be sure. Yep. Great, cool. 
And um, so thank you for that, uh, for that introduction. And uh, the, uh, it was um, the, uh, I, I look, I, by the way, I think you, if you can um, trademark that term hibernali, um, which you used in your introduction, I think you'll be able to fund all the next uh, uh, Biennales for a couple of years, because that's, uh, that's brilliant. Um, so, so what I, so what I want to do is, uh, is show you a little bit of chimeric so taking a, bit, on a tour of it. And, you know, my background is, um, as Gayatri said, is, is uh, kind of in filmmaking. And I always love storytelling in that way. And as a kid, I would make, make um, short films. I also, um, you know, would um, create stories and things. But over time, I became kind of frustrated by some of the limitations of filmmaking. Um, one of which is that, um, the ecosystem required to watch a film, whether it's on Netflix now or on, on a movie theater is, is very complex. And I wondered what would happen when you could no longer, um, when you could no longer um, watch them in, the, in, those, in those means. And I started thinking about things that, uh, things that, that last. I also was frustrated that for a film, you have to visualize everything, even if you're not visualizing things by putting them off camera. And so I wanted things to to exist in a more ambiguous space. So that started this um, this process called Chimerics there. And so let me uh, just get this um, set up. And here. And if you uh, share screen. And by the way, one of the nice things about, um, you know, a stone is that once you have it installed, you don't have to worry about booting it up this way. You don't have to worry about internet connection. The stone is pretty much there for a while. Um, so this is the, uh, it, by the way, your pronunciation was great. Um, it's chimerics there. Um, and it comes from the cognate word chimera, um, which means the true physicality of the planet um, or universe. And an exterior, which is a shape with almost an infinity of dimensions or sides, infinity minus 29 to be exact. And that's the, the name of this parallel world. And this is a map of it. And you can see it kind of coexists with our world um, to some extent. And those other areas are kind of regions which have different qualities of existence. So uh, in different sort of balance. So quality of existence is time, it's space, it's feralempt, it's things like that. So I'll show you some of the um, places we would see. Okay, so the very first mark we did was extremely simple. Um, it's in Athens, Georgia, uh, which is, uh, which is in uh, the south of the US and it's not that many, many words. And the most recent one I did is in Bhutan um, where we actually built this structure and uh, it tells the story of languages of experience, which are basically languages where you, in order to, each of the words is an experience. So if you say, if you create a mountain, which not all of us can do, then that's the word for happiness. Um, and so it's, it, you choose your words carefully in this language. And um, this is, the, this is the, um, the, the view from it. And so the project has evolved in a very organic way. And again, I think it's one of the things I've really enjoyed about it is that I started with this germ of an idea and that was about 18 oh, years ago. And, Same uh, like well said. And so we um, it started with this germ of an idea and it's kind of blossomed and I really tried to surrender to that journey. And um, the, the whole experience with um, Be Fantastic and with the, with the artist you saw introduced has really, really been quite rewarding and sort of taking one particular aspect of the project to a new level. So I'm gonna kind of quickly um, go through um, some of the places we, we have the sites. Um, so this is a map of the, of the, the installations. Um, far, it, we hope there, there are many more. Um, this is one that's on the south coast of Java and uh, tells the story of nesting grounds of five and a half wing birds. This is one in, um, in, uh, in Iceland, and it tells the story of interdimensional hopscotch. Um, this is a installation underwater off the coast of um, Bali. And 
I'm doing this quickly. And one of the nice things about this whole dialogue, by the way, is I, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm um, wrong, wrong Kami, the, um, the sort of chat in the, um, Dar in the Dara channel is gonna stay open for a couple of days. So if people have further questions, we don't have to go into everything right now. So, um, and, uh, and so it just, you know, if you feel like I've gone too fast, there'll be uh, plenty of time to um, explore in other ways. Um, some of them are in stone. This is one that's going to Portugal. And others are pressed, letters pressed into concrete. So this is one that we've done in the middle of the US and in Indiana. And it's beautiful because they so, over time, the letters sort of fall out and then you can do sort of um, soft graffiti by rearranging the, the letters. And uh, it's in this, um, but it's also interesting how it interacts with the environment because you can see it here, you can see those shapes and it tells the story of a healing palindrome. I'll get to the shapes in a second. Um, where uh, in order, when the people who lived underwater, because in chimerics, there's, there are some people who are biologically aquatic and some people who are culturally aquatic. So the culturally aquatic people are, you know, breathe air and they have to bring it down through tunnels by water moles and things like that. But the biologically aquatic people live where the oxygen vents are so intense, they can just breathe the water. And so when they get washed ashore, it's almost like um, drowning for us. And they try to heal each other by creating these palindromes and tossing them on the land. And then as the palindrome heals, the person heals. So this was a beautiful place to tell the story because it floods um, a couple of times a year and then it, the water recedes. And it's really great to see how the, um, the environment itself um, uh, impacts it. And uh, you know, they cover it in the snow in the winter. And so that's where, part of the beauty of seeing these sites as they, as, they, as they evolve and take on their own life. This is one we did in, in Rajasthan uh, near Jaisalmer. And uh, the person who invited me there asked, would I like to, would I be able to use, would it be okay to use the, um, the skills of the, of the carver, of their carver, uh, Karim Bai, um, and the golden sandstone? And needless to say, the answer was yes. It's very, uh, very beautiful, beautiful material. Uh, this is uh, one that's in the middle of the um, in the in the middle of the U.S. And that's the um, the shape. These shape words that you see are from a, a language called um, uh, um, Nielvate, which is um, these shape words are not the the shapes themselves have um, the meaning. And these are the words that the people who lived underwater had to use because they couldn't talk underwater. So as I said, this is the shape uh, the shape word for eclipse. And it's much more like a spoken language than a written language because the shapes have to manifest themselves. Um, and uh, in the same way that, you know, in Spanish, the word that means word is palabra, but in English it's word, you know, the, the, those sounds don't actually have any, that, any intrinsic meaning per se, um, except words like meow and stuff like that. Um, but they, uh, the shape words um, are kind of that way. And now this brings me to another part of it. I mentioned that I was frustrated by um, the, the limitations of filmmaking. So it's very hard to, to bake a film and the shape of word, and there's no reason why a, um, a, a language should not also be tasty. Uh, I haven't persuaded Rosetta Stone to license this, but we're working on it. Um, this is the shape word that means song. And uh, then these different colorations are different, um, basically kind of like the, uh, the prepositions and um, mean, cer mean certain things. So each of these is decodable, but we're gonna, we'll save that for another time. And uh, it's, it's been a, a great addition to the Chimerics, their storytelling piece. And, and you can see that these shapes also com come into um, other forms as well. This is part of the design for the moon. We got some shapes are inspired by the, um, you know, we tried to find patterns on the moon and these are actually where impact sites um, from, uh, it's almost like the, the, um, the human, the debris of human uh, lunar exploration was drawn to create shapes that, that, um, that map to the chimeric sphere shapes. So this is a shape, which means the luminous texture of textures that's on the moon. And again, this is all something we can discuss in detail in the chat. Um, now I'm gonna to come to the part that, bring, that, that relates really directly to the uh, experience um, uh, in, I was about to say here in Bangalore, which only shows how um, how internalized I have this entire experience of of, of working with um, with the artists. Uh, but it's I'm actually here in Los Angeles. 
But one of the things we started earlier, I mentioned that one of my frustrations was um, the visualization, the limitations of, of visualization, because one of the great things about, um, you know, when you read a book, um, you imagine it for yourself. And I think we've all at some point had an argument with a friend over the movie version of a book and how either it's brilliant or it's great, or how could they leave this out or how could they cast that person? And the great thing about words is that um, they leave place for a lot of things. I use even, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the um, struck by um, that phrase, fauna of mirrors, which is a beautiful phrase. And, you know, it can be the beginning of an entire, you know, um, Biennale or Hibernale. Um, and, and it, uh, and that's the, that's the power of it. And we all bring our own idea of it. When I heard the phrase, when you first told, told us about it, um, I was imagining one thing, then you show that picture, and then that's a very specific interpretation. I don't even know if the photographer thought of that, but it was a perfect inclusion based on the curation. It doesn't really matter. The point is, is that that ambiguity is fantastic. And so I wanted to kind of have the visualization of this world um, live live in that kind of ambiguity. So these are artists in Spain. Um, when we dedicated a, a marker about Nasiens, and you probably all learned about these in school, um, but Nasiens are seven-legged deer-like creatures whose prime-numbered legs are very nutritious and their non-prime-numbered legs are poisonous unto death. Um, so if you just take a bite, the other thing, interesting thing, it can sustain you for a month. So it's very something that explorers like, like to use because if you're greedy and you just eat it, then it's like sort of regular, regular food. But um, uh, so the Nasian is a very interesting creature. So you all have some sort of a thought in your mind about this, probably maybe vague, maybe specific. Um, but you can also, you know, this is when the artist we um, we painted a wall with different interpretations of the Nazian. So this is one artist. Here's another. Um, and when I went to Armenia, I told stories about the um, Nazians to some wood carvers, and this is their interpretation, one of their interpretations of the story. And the nice thing is that they're all, um, yeah. And if you're counting, by the way, there are three of them right there. So I know people get a little concerned about that, but um, the uh, but. The nice thing about it is that all of them, um, all of them are, there are a lot of right answers. There are also some, some wrong answers. If you made an eight legged one, um, that would, be, that would not be, you know, the tr true spirit of the Nazian. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, that's one of the things I love about trying to tell these stories in a particular place where there's all this data telling you you're really there and, and yet um, you're imagining for, your, for yourself. Um, and this is another one. This is done by a group of women in Namibia called at Penduka. Um, we did a whole whole collaboration with them and uh, made some some beautiful embroideries. So that brings us to um, the, the Ashwantpur flyover, uh, which did not work out. Um, Archana was, did feel I was one of the few people in her life that had ever been excited that about flyovers um, and in chimerics there. Uh, so we in the end we couldn't uh, do it here. But it started the dialogue um, and it, uh, that led to the one that we're on now, which um, we're hoping will be the Wheeler flyover. And this is kind of a, a rendering of it. And, and the, the thing about flyovers that, is that in Chimerics, there, there's a group of people called the Tehachapi. And the Tehachapi are the great road building culture of Chimerics there. And what they, um, what's interesting about them is that they built what looks to, to us a lot like roads. And these you know, we're not saying that the flyovers in, um, in Bangalore were done by the Tachibi, but they are strikingly similar to them. And the, they made them to make music. And I think sometimes we've all heard that music when we're driving down the road, especially when there's sort of ridges or textures in the road that produce a particular sound. And that happened here was a, a woman um, in Kula Larza who had um, been punished by Compass, and Compass is the urge in God directionality who's trying to make the world too simple, but she'd been punished by Compass for stopping uh, some bloodshed. And so she, um, she, she, um, so she, tra um, so they were, she was protected by this beautiful um, saber tooth tiger, a named Jing cat actually, which is a kind of the tiger uh, named Jalot Komen who protected her because she could, when her curse was that her gift of language was taken away 
and she could only speak without word. She could only speak again when she could speak without words to one without words. So we shared this story with the uh, um, with the artists, and um, we have uh, a number of teams. And one of the other interesting things is that um, the artists were working in teams, and then they were um, being mentored by um, uh, by by three other artists, um, Amitab, Mbakula, and Hassan, and Chanakya, and um, and we. Uh, and we came up with some, we went on a beautiful journey together. And so this whole presentation is really inspired by their work as much as the journey was started by um, the So this is, uh, for example, this is the, um, the this, this is from the gross, and this is the tower of wisdom that um, cool, that Kula of Larsa had a vision of. She had a vision of a uh, Ekelman de Cruella, which is a tower of wisdom. And actually in the linear world, it was in, um, a village called uh, um, Sakad near Sendwa in Madhya Pradesh. So, but she hadn't quite gotten there yet at this point in the story. But this is another version of that tower. And um, uh, uh, by the Dangaroos. And this is another version. Uh, sorry, that previous one was by the Eowas. So let me get back. That's by the Eowas. And this is by the Dangaroos. And see, there's all very different towers they all have the, the essence of the idea that it's almost like a monastery kind of uh, place that has all sorts of, um, you know, um, you know, has libraries and things like that on it. And then this is one by the women of Penduka. It's their version of the tower. And the point is that they're all the same in some way, but they're also different. And what I love about it is that it leaves, lets all of us imagine our own version of that tower. Uh, for example, this is Kula Larsa that, um, that, you know that's that's one woman by the one one interpretation by the by the shapeshifters, and then you know we have the uh, the dang, the dangaroos again, and that's their interpretation of her. And again, it's you know you it's it's up to you to to take th this insp uh, this inspiration to imagine it in your own way. And each each group captured different aspects of the story. There's the um, the saber tooth. Uh, there's uh, the name Jing cat, um, the the tiger there that Kulov is. Is writing um, that's by the the Olas. and it's really it's really a powerful experience to see, and it's going to be a powerful experience to see all these different versions in the same space animating a um, a narrative that we see here. Uh, this is a depiction of um, of the the fight that led the Tachbi to um, to come 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 to what we call um, what we call Bangalore. So. The work has been incredibly beautiful. We're honored that um, that um, Bakula and Amitabh are going to contribute, um, paint, uh, be painting um, uh, uh, pillars of their own with their own interpretations of these, and I think it's going to be um, quite a remarkable experience for the. Just say um, to just talk about. I wanted to finish with a, a little poem, and it's a poem that's in the shape language, and people often say, "Well." Um, you know, it, it's, you know, how, how does that work exactly? And so these are all, and basically the poem talks about um, these creatures who go um, to the moon um, to, to basically uh, um, go to the moon because they want to, they, they want to visit there when, and they want to be able to come back and they aren't able to because they haven't thought through the plan well enough. And they, their luminous light is what, what we see at the beginning of the new moon. And so all these shapes, um, you know, each one um, tells a piece of that story, and I'm obviously doing it fast. But what I wanted to get at is I mentioned that this notion that the sounds of words don't necessarily have an intrinsic meaning on the whole. And so, so example, when you hear somebody rhyme something, it, it, it's, it's not that it, the, the fact that the words rhyme, um, it's kind of arbitrary. And yet it's become quite meaningful to us. And so part of what, what I'm trying to do with this parallel world is create a, things, a group of things that at first seem arbitrary, but also over time have meaning. And I can't do it without help. And we had a great deal of help from all the artists you've met on this, um, on this call. And we hope you'll, you'll participate in the, um, in, in, uh, in the, in the um, event in, a, in about a month where we show the final versions of all these things. And we also uh, hope you'll see the final uh, installation um, when it happens 
um, uh, when it's all, all possible. So that's a quick overview of chimerics there. Um, and thank you all for, uh, for hearing me out. Thank you, Eames. Um, I, I think we're going over to Jack now, right? So um, I'm going to introduce Jack. Uh, Jack Hardiker is an interdisciplinary artist, designer, and storyteller. He works uh, with both established and emergent artistic techniques to tell important stories in full, memorable, and unexpected ways. As a senior digital designer, Jack led global projects from inception to delivery for clients, including the BBC, Orange, and American Express. More recently, his work as a digital artist has received organic press coverage, along with numerous award nominations. Critical analysis and research are integral to Jack's practice. He is a vocal advocate for the inclusion of a diverse range of voices in the creative process and has drawn particular inspiration from Donna Haraway's situated design methodologies. In his personal work, um, Jack explores human bias through questions of who is seen and heard, but more importantly, who is not. He also teaches at the Royal College of Art and University of Arts London. Today, uh, Jack will walk us through some of his previous projects like Augmented Reality Mystery Bird and Virtual Reality VG Theater. Mystery Bird was born in Manchester to reach audiences beyond the Manchester tour. Jack created an AR artwork that can be experienced by anyone with a smartphone. The artwork was viewed by more than 8,000 people around the world. In the VGVR, Jack and his co-creator used archival records uh, to create a non-linear VR theater piece about the 1939 murder of gangster David Beetle, the Beetle, as hauntingly captured in a photograph by the photographer VG. Um, Jack, your, um, your work has opened up my mind to new possibilities uh, for using design and tech in public art, as well as in education um, insurance programs. So I hope we get to work together really yeah. soon. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thanks for that amazing introduction. and. Um... Thank you for inviting me and for everyone involved in arranging it. Uh, I've kind of blown away by Eames's work, blown away by Gertrude's work. Just, um, yeah, how do I follow either of your work? It's amazing. Um, so uh, I will try. Um, I'm going to talk you through um, some, some projects and some experiments. Um, I'm going to set a timer on my phone to tell me to shut up when it's time to shut up. Um, Okay, here we go. Okay. Um, so the first project, I'll, I'll just share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, great. Um, so I'm going to start with a project that's um, particularly hard to demonstrate in a presentation. Um, so this is a project that primarily involves sound. Um, so you're just going to be staring at a white screen for the next couple of minutes. Um, the project began um, in Manchester, which is the city I'm from. I now live in London, England. Um, but the, the, there's a wonderful festival called Manchester International Festival that happens in Manchester every two years. Um, and there was a, an incredible show called Fatherland um, by a theatre co company called Frantic Assembly. Um, and the um, writers of the show and writer-directors of the show um, went to their hometowns around the north of England and collected stories with fathers and sons. They then turned that verbatim, they then turned that, that, that um, dialogue into a verbatim script. Um, and the show was absolutely beautiful. It was in uh, one of my favorite theaters in the world, the Royal Exchange um, in Manchester. Uh, I, I took that idea and um, decided to develop it slightly or kind of, you know, add, add a different element to it. Um, and it began quite tongue in cheek. And I uh, created a project called Father Line and I developed a, a telephone line. So um, I think some of what Gayatri said about um, kind of using some of these analog technologies that we're, we're used to, I think it, it, it kind of chimed with me. Um, this was a telephone line, like any kind of boring telephone line, you type in a number and call it up and um, you'd be greeted with a voiceover that would ask you whether you wanted to listen to stories or leave a story. And I, I kind of prompted people to leave stories, not just about fatherhood or being child of a father, but to talk about um, motherhood or being a guardian of a child. Um, and 
like I say, the project began as a, a bit tongue in cheek. The sound design you'll hear in a second was quite cheesy. Um, I, I thought people would leave joke, jokey stories and I called up and left a jokey story. But then the story started to roll in and, um, and I was sat in the middle of Manchester listening to these stories and I'd burst into tears. I'll play um, just a, a, a what one story I think I've got time for. Oh, but you know what I didn't do? I didn't um, set sound correctly then. So give me a second. Share screen again, share sound. There we go. Oh, can everyone see again? Sorry. Yeah, great. Welcome to Fatherline an anonymous space to listen to and share stories about fatherhood. To listen to stories, press 1. To record and share a story, press 2. Hi, my dad was a crazy busy businessman for the whole of my childhood and was not really there while I was growing up. Um, fast forward 35 years on and uh, my mother had a very serious case of meningitis and was left very badly brain damaged. Uh, she's now uh, the equivalent age of about two my dad completely turned around, became the most loving, caring person in the whole world. I have no idea where he found the strength from. He's like a completely different man. And uh, life's a lesson and life's a task. He's just a guy. We would all do the same, but he's my dad. I'm super proud of him. Hi, Father Line. Um, one of the best memories that I have of my dad is when I was little, he used to be the one that used to cut my nails when I was very small. Um, and before he passed away, actually, the Friday before he passed away, I gave him a manicure, and it's one of the fondest memories that I have, especially because he used to do that for me, um, and I love him very much, and all these stories have been amazing. Thank you. I'll, I'll I remember it was good, so uh, my dad actually... Uh, I'll cut that short there. Um, so um, just just kind of staying on that project for one second, I think what was really... what what I, what I was kind of surprised by um, as someone that's had to do quite a few kind of traditional interviews, shoving a microphone in people's face. I think using that technology that people absolutely understood and people really understanding that they were having a um, anonymous experience. I think I actually ended up collecting stories and, and results from that that I have never had the ability to collect with a microphone in people's faces. Um, so yeah, quickly moving on, not got much time. Uh, this is a project called Opus Criminale, so it's it's quite different project. Um, uh, I'll just read this out. It's, a, it's an intimate, uh, it's an interactive time capsule that uses sound, light, and mist to amplify forgotten voices in the Victoria and Albert Museum. So, I approach every story with the story first, and then think about the technology after. Um, uh, I yeah, what Eames said about um, the physical like objects in places um, not having to deal with lots of the frustrating technical issues I completely agree with and um, that's why I don't always jump to the fanciest technology and I'll, I'll try and use you know telephone lines things like that but yeah I start with the story first so this project began with the story first um, I, uh, I was exploring the Victoria and Albert Museum and found um, sorry yeah and found that the um, the mosaics that run throughout the v &A Museum in London um, that were designed by Francis Moody um, were actually created in the mid 19th century by female convicts at Woking Prison. Um, and I just couldn't believe this story and I couldn't believe that it wasn't um, told anywhere in the museum. So I went, in, I went and looked through prison records from that time around that area and started to piece together some of these stories um, from these female convicts um, uh, and they were just, incredible and so then with that amount of source material and then that verbatim script um, I then thought about how I wanted to present the, the, um, the stories and so I, I took them back into the museum and presented them using um, directional speakers, uh, a beam of light that lit up an individual tile and then the sound so I'll play a short video.
I don't know where it's going. It's <laughs> somewhere a lot nicer than here. I wish I could see it all together. We see our little bits, but it's hard to see what it all is. One day, I'll dance on them. I'll have a big dress. Imagine that. I didn't do it, you know. It wasn't me. Uh, I bet all the girls have said... So, yeah, again, a very, uh, it was a very different project from the previous project, but this the kind of running theme was, it, it was about trying to find untold or kind of um, underexplored stories. Um, jumping to a completely different project. Um, I really enjoy working with people and, um, and working with people to explore um, stories, complex stories that affect people's daily lives. So um, I've had a long-standing um, research project into in AI um, and technological bias and AI. So I developed this workshop, um, an, interactive, an interactive workshop that demystifies artificial intelligence through physical recreations of the processes behind AI. So AI technologies, I'm, uh, I'm sure many people on this call already know some of this, but AI technologies are being used increasingly in critical services such as policing and healthcare. And whilst our public awareness of the biases involved in AI, um, it, it, it's growing and we're reading lots of news stories about a bias in AI, um, the, the debate often lacks technical, historical and cultural insight. So um, to try and demystify some of the, the, the processes be, be behind AI, um, I developed a workshop that was a that involved paper, pens, and plastic um, to explain some of the processes behind AI vision. Um, and I, I then used that workshop to frame a discussion about the potential for bias. Um, I took the workshop to um, a Steiner school um, and, and, and worked with 13, 14 year olds. That was particularly interesting because Steiner, Steiner schools have a no technology rule. Um, so actually they, they, they were really kind of used to working with just paper, pens, plastic, and what have you. Um, this, this was another project that, that kind of ties in with that, with that theme. So this, this has two, two sides to it, this project really. So it, on the one side, it continues my research interest in AI. So I used the misclassification of hummingbirds um, to explain the frailty and the bias that can be built into AI systems. So quick background of, of the, the hummingbird. The hummingbird has been repeatedly misclassified um, throughout history. It was originally believed to be from South America because most species are found in South America, but then a fossil was found in Germany that, that, that predated any fossil found ever in South America by a million years. So I guess what I was trying to say was that um, what, what you know, we sometimes believe to be objective fact is actually fully subjective. Um, so that's one side of the project. The other side of the project is that I'm really passionate about bringing the arts and performance and storytelling um, to people outside of um, major cities or outside of white box gallery settings. Um, so th this film will kind of discuss uh, a bit more that side of the project than the, than the AI side, but yeah. Kids really sort of take to technology and obviously in this day and age, kids are born with it, they can use it straight away. We have iPads in the classroom which they can use and you know they're actually better than the adults at doing that. And we've got um, some children who have special needs who when we introduce some technology into the classroom, they took to it straight away and it actually helps them sort of uh, express their creativity.
So what you saw in that film was um, a, uh, I shouldn't say a traditional gallery installation, um, but it was a gallery installation that involved metal, wood, screens. Um, it could only be viewed by the people that could attend the exhibition. Um, it, it could only um, it could only be viewed by people that could make it into central London. And then what you then see is a, an app that I created, which is a version of that same installation, but that can be viewed anywhere. So it, it synchronizes six phones and you can watch a multi-channel art installation go between phones. And my kind of aspiration moving forward is that I'd really like to open up the platform um, to other artists and, and anyone that's creating multi-channel um, video or audio work and that wants to publish it beyond a gallery or museum setting. Um, I will skip this one, I think. There we go. Um, so yeah, just a couple more projects. This is a project called Mystery Bird. So birds seem to follow me everywhere I go. My girlfriend is named after a bird and, and I seem to just keep doing projects about birds. Um, uh, this was an, a traveling immersive installation that involved projection, sound and augmented reality. So. Mystery Bird was born in Manchester before taking flight around the world with augmented reality. But the project began right in the midst of um, COVID uh, in, in the UK. And Manchester was one of the worst um, hit cities in the UK for COVID. And were, were, they were basically, or said they, we were basically in lockdown for over a year. Um, so no one had access to the arts or culture. So right in the midst of all that, um, uh, around Christmas time, um, we toured a project around the streets of Manchester and the project involved um, a, a number of artists coming together and um, developing uh, what, what I'll show you in a second, which is um, an installation that was strapped to the back of a van and travelled around a number of streets in lots of different areas in Manchester and it involved projection and beautiful audio. Um, and yeah, so I'll show you a, a, a quick film about that and then I'll show you the augmented reality element. So I don't know, I don't know whether this was the case the world over, but certainly in the UK, everyone started to talk about this idea that nature was returning to the cities and we could all hear birdsong much clear, much more clearly. And that the project was kind of influenced, was influenced by that. Um, but um, but uh, actually it turned out it was just that actually traffic noise was much quieter. Um, so then th that project um, was taken around the streets of Manchester, but we wanted to do something else with it. We wanted to create an AR part of the project so that the project could reach even more people. Um, so we developed a, an AR artwork that involves these same paper birds, but um, in augmented reality so that we could reach, you know, I think 8,000 people. So very quickly to finish up, um, I've been working a lot recently with theatre companies and a lot of this work has um, been prompted by COVID and theatre companies suddenly having a kind of, let's say, willingness to work with technology that they wouldn't have otherwise worked with. 
Um, so just a couple of quick examples of, of work, work that's in progress. So um, this is an app that I've been de developing with a theatre company. Um, they're doing a project around water scarcity, but we've developed an app that um, will help direct audience members around a large, it's a large outdoor location, but also involves some storytelling. So we'll have tannoy announcements coming out of the app. We'll be able to send secret messages to people and to direct them to different parts of the performance. Um, it's always important for me to test technology on big range of people. So we took this out to um, Fenland, which is one of the locations it's going to be. We test it with a bunch of locals. This was using the phones to, to present a Tannoy announcement for all of the phones at the same time. And then this is a big project I've been working on for a while. I'm co-creating a um, show in Northern Ireland. Um, this uh, the audience are going to be uh, are going to be half online and half in real life. So we're doing this hybrid theatre, um, and the actors are going to have to perform to both an audience online and an audience in the in the um, in the location. It's going to be in an old shopping centre. The online audience are going to play the role of a kind of security team, um, and so this is a, an interface that we started to create. Um, that allows them to see the venue, but also interact with the venue. They'll be able, to, the online audience will be able to turn lights on and off, open doors, um, set strange sculptures moving, but also interact with um, audience members and also performers. And that is everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. That was amazing. I, I think we didn't get into the VG theater, but I, uh, everything's on your website. So I think uh, people can go there and check it out. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I No, no, I it's okay. I, 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 I remember we discussed it and I was thinking that that is one of those few projects where photography is also there. I, but I, I, yeah, I wanted to, do, I, I really wanted to show it because I think it, it really relates to what you were saying about photography as being uh, the, presenting the parallel, this parallel universe or a kind of, yeah, the subjectivity of photography. But unfortunately, I had to skip it because of time. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's on, well, let's see. Uh, yeah. It's on uh, your website and you can check it out. Um, so, Kami, shall I just get into the, the kind of like discussion? Yes, please. Uh, just warning everybody, this is the first time I'm doing this. So I had I've come up with a few questions, which I think we can kind of start off with, and then let's see where the conversation goes. I also saw that there are some <laughs> questions already coming in. So we'll tackle those, um, I guess, in another 10 minutes. Okay. So, um, okay, the first question or prompt, I guess, was uh, because I also work a lot with students and young people, was how how the both of you um, uh, engage with young young people. Um, Eames, for example, in our conversation last week, you mentioned that in one of the sites, you whispered some secrets into the ears of children. Um, and then I think, Jack, you work with some schools. So do you want to elaborate on any projects uh, where you work with young people? And maybe why, why you like doing that? Um, Eames, yeah, you want to go first? Yeah. I, I, uh, I'll just say um, the, I mean, the, the, what you're referring to is that there was, uh, there's an installation in, in Spain where there's a, uh, a hidden message that's encoded through bolded letters, which is pretty simple in a way, um, but it's the, the one that's encoded in the Spanish is in English and vice versa. And so the only people we told about it in detail, I guess I have to swear you all to secrecy, so um, you got to keep it to yourself, um, is that um, were, the, were the kids that were skateboarding there. And it was sort of, it kind of be, was their kind of um, curatorial knowledge as it were. And they, it was that nice feeling of, of have, having a, um, of having a secret. And I, I would say in general, one of the things I've noticed, it's not just with kids, it's with everybody, but it's definitely with kids is that the way the Chimerics their project helps uh, um, kids um, um, look at the map of the world in a somewhat different way. Um, Cause I think most people don't feel like they're on the map of the world even people in Manhattan feel like the other part of that Manhattan is what's on the map of the world. And so, you know, and, and so I, I think that that's, um, but it's a powerful, it's a powerful feeling. And it's been one of the interesting aspects of it is, is feeling, is seeing how people feel connections to other parts of the world that are just because this strange artist came in and uh, did something there. I mean, I also noticed that the Chimerics project itself has a lot of like educational 
you know, there's these activity books and um, those baking, yeah. um, um, I, what do you call them? Cookie cutters and, and a lot of things for children. Or are you think that the audience is sort of general? I mean, I think everybody, just about everybody likes a cookie, even if they shouldn't. Um, but the, um, but I think the the, but there are stuff that's for kids, and this whole disputed likeness thing. And I just want to add one thing, which that I I didn't mention, which is to acknowledge that one of the interesting things for me about this whole project and working with Be Fantastic is that we're adding augmented reality to it, in part to, um, for this specific venue. And it's been a great exploration for me, but also to see how um, the the art the artists are utilizing that. And I think it's going to be a great way to communicate without undermining the experience, but commuting communicating part of the story in a kind of um, in a different way to the neighborhood. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks, Eames. Uh, Jack, do you want to go next um, yeah. on this whole engagement with children? Um, so I think that a couple of things. So I think I think with the project, with the workshop that I showed you, the AI workshop, I think it was um, it was important for me to speak to children because um, uh, I think it's important for for us to engage with children about the topic of AI and about the topic of technological bias because without sounding too cheesy, they are the future. Um, and so I think it's important that they they really kind of understand that really early and understand the consequences of their lives online, for example, understand the consequences of the things that they say now or may come back to haunt them in the future. Um, I think to Eames's point, uh, children are, are, you know, miraculously imaginative. So um, the, that's a wonderful reason to work with children is that you, you can, you know, if you ask a room full of adults to, um, draw a bird but try and disregard everything they've ever known about a bird um uh, you're going to get some maybe not as rewarding results as if you ask a, a group of eight-year-olds to do the same um the especially the if you th tell the bird especially if you tell them that the bird has five and a half wings or something <laughs> exactly like that. yeah exactly <laughs> um, and then the and then the final point is that you know as you've seen some of my work and and what i'd say is a lot of the reason that you know the reason that quite a lot of my work has been technology focused might have something to do with the past two years and being in lockdown and being on my own at my computer. Um, uh, but when you make work in, that involves phones or make work that you're putting out into the public sphere, I think it's important that I know that different people can use it. So the AR um, thing that I showed you, you know, I think it's important that a child can use it or that an old person can use it. So um, I, I wrote uh, with that project, I actually ended up writing up a kind of PDF just to um, help people that were not used to navigating a phone or navigating AR and really step by step, step gave a, a guide, but that was obviously for older people because children can use better phones better than I can, but, um, but yeah. Yeah, we're always surprised with how much they already know before we give we give them a device. Um, yeah, unlike an adult who probably needs to read or go on YouTube and you know yeah. uh, all of that. Um, yeah. So okay, my next um, question. I think this comes from our own sort of experience with working in public art. Is you know what does it mean to be accessible, or what is accessibility mean to us? Who is this audience that we're working for, and um, how do you in your practices, and this can be either of you, whoever wants to answer, um, are you using design and technology to make something more accessible? Who wants to go? Jack, do you want to try first? Yeah, go for it, Jack. Yeah, so uh, it's an interesting one working with technology and talking about access, because I think you raised some interesting points, um, Gayatri, that, um, that, te that technology is not, accessible to everyone and I think it's probably one of the reasons that I'm I I tend I do some VR work but I don't do loads of VR work and it's because VR technology is incredibly inaccessible to people but even talking about working with phones I I, I talk a lot about opening access to art and performance and theatre using ubiquitous devices but um, but like you pointed out, not everyone does have a mobile phone, not everyone does have a laptop. So actually, it's a, it's a constant weird um, clash uh, of considerations in my head, because I think that people really, a lot of, uh, a lot of the UK, at least, I won't speak for the world, um, 
don't have access to theatre and a lot of the UK do have access to mobile phones and do have access to computers. So for me, um, access um, and accessibility, it, it, it works for me using technology in, in, in the UK for that reason. Um, but I'm not sure if that would be the case um, around the world. But I, I tend to think that kind of the benefits of, of using tech is you've got um, socioeconomic reasons that it's, it's better, you know, theatre tickets are expensive, traveling to theatres are expensive. Um, there are disability considerations. If you can present work uh, remotely, if you know a lot of Zoom theatre, people spoke a lot over lockdown about how incredible it was to be able to watch theatre on Zoom for people that don't normally, literally can't physically get to a theatre. So yeah, babbled a bit there. But. Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, I think it's, it's like everything else that um, there's no perfect answer. I mean, the, the, um, the, so I, you know, I say, I don't want to be, you know, I like doing these analog things, but at the same time, that's also limited in terms of who gets to each one. One, one of my goals is to, one of the reasons to do them in many different places is to make them nearby relatively, mm -hmm. um, ideally within a, within a day's bus ride for, for most people. And um and then I think that when the interesting thing is, I think that humans are so good at context that once they see one in place, yes, it'd be nice to see some other ones maybe, but they would you just project, it's like they would project their um, their knowledge, even as subconscious of, of, of what it was like um, to, to be there. It's like we all, we all have see pictures of places we will never go. And we know there's a gap, but in some ways it's, it's, um, it's a, uh, we, we, the trade-off is we get to see some of it and we have some mm. way of sort of, um, you know, interpolating what we think that, that space, that space will be like. And I think that, you know, one of these things with the, with this um, experiment that we've done here um, with the, um, you know, with the augmented reality is going to be interesting to see how that um, affects people. And, um, you know, each of the groups has done some of their own, own things, some amplifying the visual, some having things that aren't actually on there. And I think what's what's exciting to me is that is that it it'll for for certainly for a certain generation it will be interesting to be able to take snapshots that include the virtual reality, which will be cool. But the other thing is that um, is that I think that it will um, it'll be a way to convey some of the story analogous to doing a street theater kind of thing, which we will we also hope to do. And so if if, it, if it's so, you know. Every, the, nothing's too, can be you can't really be too absolutist about any any of these things mm. even though you get some fruit from um looking in these different perspectives yeah i think i mean this this brings me to the next question because i i had this thought of you know you working with stone and bronze and obviously mm. you're imagining that this these sites are going to live on for a long time right they're mm. going to have a long life i don't know maybe that's what your plan is and people in the future will see them but mm. most of the i think the tech stuff that we're doing you know websites or mm. installations which are digital they don't really have that sort mm. of a, a life that you know mm. beyond a certain point if someone's not maintaining it for example or someone didn't update something it's not going to happen so what what do you feel about that what do you feel about the lifetime of a particular um, art installation or a project Um, I'll just say that I am kind of obsessed with the topic. Um, I think one of the things that's actually different between digital and analog is that the nice thing about analog is that, or the stone, for example, is that a partial version still contain, contains um, a lot of the, um, the, the, the message. So mm -hmm. partial communication of the stone, even if somebody were to hit with a sledgehammer, you could put it together. And, and obviously not all these things are going to survive. Maybe none of them will. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. But um, whereas with digital, it's like when you find a photo, a physical photo, um, and it's been torn, but you can see like most of the face, you still um, have this special thing. When you find a CD that's been stepped on, there's no partial anything. You just can't use it. And that to yeah. me is, 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 the, is, is the challenge. Absolutely. I, I, I think that's a perfect analogy. And there are, there are whole teams at um, archives that are just responsible for maintaining crap old machinery to play old videos or old CDs. Um, but it was, it, it, it actually, that, that kind of segues 
to something I was interested in with Eames's work, which was, you, you know, you mentioned one of the so the sculptures was sandstone, which obviously will degradate quickly. Um, and I was wondering if there was any part of the project which was about recording that degradation and checking back on how these things are evolving or changing over time. Well, it's, it's you know, we're, we're lucky to get the ne next one going. So I will say um, there's that aspect, but th there, it's pretty well documented. And the most dramatic one is we have a, a, a very early installation it is in the desert outside Los Angeles in Joshua Tree. And it, it actually is a structure that is falling, uh, is, is slowly decaying. We didn't help by sandblasting part of it um, <laughs> to sculpt it a little bit, but it's been interesting to observe. And, and, it, and I do have a policy about it that um, we do repair vandalism, which you could argue is a natural form of decay, but it tends to be a tipping point, especially in the desert, because then it feels abandoned. So whereas things that are more like the wind and stuff like that. Um, and uh, but the sandstone, the golden sandstone, just to give a shout out to golden sandstone, is that they did make the fort in Jaisalmer out of it. And it's still there after 500 right. years. So I wouldn't count it out, but it's no. um, so. But, but that that's definitely an ongoing concern and um you know some of the early so yeah but i definitely keep track of it and we're yeah i, I was thinking about yeah. i was thinking about the fine the fine lettering i was imagine you know to, to to read those stories i was imagining that but i was i wasn't i was i wasn't thinking that actually necessarily took away took away from it because there's a mystique in yeah. the story slowly slowly disintegrating and as you say there'll be words still visible for hundreds of years it might just not all piece together in the exact way it used to exactly it, yeah it, it's totally it's, it's part of the it's part of the deal that's what yeah but yeah I, I mean on the on the on the kind of um fleeting nature of digital art it is you know it is really interesting and uh, really difficult to work out how how to how to maintain things um, the more complex, uh, for example, you, I, I did a project um, 10 years ago or something where um, it, every single time someone watched a film, it was a completely different film. It hijacked footage from all over the internet um, to very specific search terms. And every time an, uh, an audience member watched- The music it was, video. Yeah, exactly. They were watching a completely different film. And, and that was great. And, uh, and it, you know, it's a wonderful project for me. It went all around the world. It was great. But um, I managed to maintain it for six months because it was just so incredibly expensive to run. <laughs> because um, every time someone watched it, that was some server power somewhere um, in, a, in a big server farm churning away. Um, and so it, in the end, I just had to, had to turn it off. But it, it, but it, would, have, um, it would have stopped working eventually anyway, because web technology moves so quickly. Yeah, that's, say, thing, yeah sorry. that's the thing about technology. And that's what I, I'll, I have one more question and then we can go into like audience questions. And uh, feel free to unmute yourselves if you want to just pop in. This idea of changing technologies, right? So I think Eames, when you started this project, let's say 18 years ago, or I don't know, I guess it was around that time, I'm thinking Facebook and Instagram and these hashtags didn't exist where you could discover right. what people were doing. It must have been a different way of engaging with the project. Um, um, and I mean, just in all of in all of our, I guess, practices, technology has changed, and I think that affects the way we work in our projects. So, how have you seen um, Chimerics here evolve as a as a way for the, you know uh, uh, along the way when platforms are also changing? Yeah, I mean, it, it has evolved. I mean, it, I made a bold decision to put the URL on there, um, which I I'm sure at some point will become obsolete. But I figured the name is in there, and so it still has some 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 value to people in the future. Um, I'm really glad I didn't do what a lot of people said and put a QR code in bronze. <laughs> it would be very embarrassing. Um, and a part of me uh, died a little bit when you mentioned in the introduction about my powers of 10 CD-ROM because think about that CD-ROM mm. and it came out um, six months before Netscape. Mm. And so as soon as Netscape yeah. came, they, you know everything that was so cool and ambitious was clearly going to be that energy was going on the web. And in fact, um, yeah, I have, there's a FM Towns machine, which is a, 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 the Japanese platform it came out on that, um, that we still have if you, if you want to see it. So, mm -hmm. so now it's gone from being technology for the masses to basically the technology equivalent of opera, you know, mm -hmm. you, know you, have to, you can only go to La Scala to, to hear it. So I think it's, 
So everything, and in in terms of chimerics there, we've always, um, you know, we our social media presence and um, Amelia is really the ringleader of that has been great, and it's in in and the the physicality of of the project, um, I think makes it interesting in that space because people always assume it's just um, that it's virtual. And then they have this moment of discovery that, wait, you can actually go there. And mm. in that sense, I think it's been, we, we have that sort of a stealth relationship to technology. And I think you had like a Flickr group. I, I heard one of your- Oh yeah, we had a Flickr, exactly. Who's using Flickr? <laughs> Who's using Flickr still? So I think, yeah, I, yeah. I, I was interested in knowing how, you know, you're, you've been using different platforms. Although I'm very proud that we, we don't have a MySpace page anymore. Mm. <laughs> it might be there somewhere. Everyone's, exactly. got, every, everyone's got a MySpace page hidden somewhere that they're very embarrassed about. Exactly. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I think... I've been haunted, Jack. Yeah, exactly. Um, reminded of all the music you used to like. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I think um, regardless of technology, uh, I think the, as long as you've got a good story, that good story can be retold again and again and again and again. Um, and it doesn't matter what te technology it's told on. I think um, uh, musical purists would say the same about a really good melody, that it can be played on a guitar or it can be played by an orchestra. Um, I disagree. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm a drummer, so um, yeah, good luck with that. But, um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I, think, I think about the projects that I've done and I think, yeah, I've, I've ended up using AR, but I could have easily, uh, you know, I, most of the projects I do just are a paper script. And then from that paper script, the next part comes. And uh, when I teach uh, uh, on a course that me and Kartika were on um, at the Royal College, I, I teach on that course now. And then um, we, you'll get students coming and saying, right, I want to do an AR project. Right, I want to do a VR project. And I'll always say, no, uh, you're going to come with, come to me with a really good story. And then we're going to work out what technology is best for that or what, you know, what, or not using technology. Are we better using stone? Are we better um, it, presenting it as a script or a film? You know, I don't know. But yeah, good stories. Yeah, good stories. I know. Um, okay, so um, Marsha, are you here? You want to unmute yourself and ask your question, or I could I could just ask it for you. Uh, let me see if she's here. Um, she's here. Do you want to unmute yourself, Marsha? Or I can ask you a question. Okay. Okay. So her question is, um, can other people claim authorship in your work, Eves or Jack? I haven't heard you mention the names of others and I'm wondering how authorship works. Uh, so in, in the, the Chimerics there is, is a story I've written. It's not based on local stories. Um, my feeling is that if I, um, even if I lived in Bangalore for six months, I'm not sure I could contribute that much new insight. And even if there was a certain lens I used, if I used it everywhere, that would become obvious pretty quickly. So I, I, um, I've decided that the, um, that the way it works is that the, um, is that, that the thing that the community, whether through the individuals who let me um, do the installation or um, in the case of um, Be Fantastic, which in Jaga, which had some responsibility for these, these flyovers, has to kind of buy into the idea that, it, that it's cool, of value, interesting, enjoyable, happiness making, whatever, whatever it is to have this other story um, uh, land there. And, you know, my own feeling is that um, I've seen very beautiful participatory work. Um, and then in the case of this, this project, um, the, the uh, disputed likenesses, but specifically what we're doing with flyover country, um, it's happening within the world of chimerics there, but as you can see from those images, there are many different interpretations. And so there will be something written on the, um, on the pillar, which will have you know, credits for everybody who participated um, and, and things like that. But I, you know, I think about myself, but when I, when I see a, a, a work by, um, by an artist or I read a book, I don't really want to change the ending or I, I'm interested. I want to hate the ending or I want to love the ending, but I don't. So I, 
I feel like it's a, it's okay for this story to be my the story that I'm 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 creating and that um and that people will hopefully get um, get something out of through the experience and through the way we present it. And then I think that um, the disputed likeness piece is re um, really came about because of the how, how can people how, how can I work with others? So that's the selfish part. I get to work with other people like the like the folks um, that are on the uh, that are on this um, on the Zoom. But also, hopefully, the part that they other people have said, how can we get involved? It kind of leaves a space that keeps the story um, straight, if you will, or the, going on the the journey that I have in mind, whether it's good or bad. But then there's also this incredible beauty that comes from seeing other people's take on it. So, a bit of a long answer, but that's that that's that's how I how, how I see it. Jack, do you want do you have a take on it on authorship? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess um, any project that that I've worked on as a collaboration, their names are you know presented alongside the work. Always, I'd say that that was quite important. But there is a distinction between um, crowdsourced or participatory work and um, work where um, I've authored the work and then worked with other people to realise that work. And they are two very different things. And work, so for example, work like um, the telephone line that I showed you at the start, the, the kind of core principle of that is that people weren't named um, and they were, they were, there was the, you, you heard a nice condensed little version of the introduction, but actually the introduction was quite lengthy because it was explaining the ins and outs of the fact that their story would be anonymous and, it's, and some of the kind of caretaking that we had to do as part of the project. Um, so I guess there's there's lots of different answers to the question, really, depending on the project. Um, okay. Um, does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask um, on, like, on by unmuting themselves? Just join the dialogue. Kamya, you want to ask your question? I think he sort of answered it, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question actually. Yeah, hi Divya. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> All right, so I have a question for Jack. Uh, I want to know if uh, gamification is like a prime part of your process. Um, it, it's, it's not something I tend to say out loud um, because for some reason the word makes me cringe. Um, but I think that it's some, it is definitely a consideration um, in, in some of the work that I'm trying to um, reach a lot of people with. Um, it, that, that, going back to that recurring theme of access and of trying to bring people in, um, sometimes it's about using um, methods that methods or technologies that we um, come across on, on, on a you know, daily basis and almost um, kind of break them, use some of the some of those methods, but use them in a new context. Use you know Instagram um, or your phone to make really interesting weird art that you wouldn't normally expect to see on Instagram on your or, or on your phone. I think probably the same goes with that gamification principle. Um, I'm not particularly interested in making games um, and yet you know, the, the, the theatre, the, the, the final project I showed you that this is an ongoing project that, that we are not making a, we're not making game theatre by any means. The director that I'm working with hates um, game theatre. Uh, uh, it's not an escape room or anything like that, it, but, it, but the, you'd be a fool to say that there wasn't some gaming involved with it because the online audience is controlling things happening in the space. That is a kind of, that is a game process. So um, I try and not think too much about gamification, but yes, it does end up popping up at times. Thank you so much. It's okay, thanks for the great question. Thanks, Divya. Um, we're actually going uh, over time a little bit, so I thought maybe we could ask one last question or two last questions with uh, Eames or Jack. If you have any questions for each other or for me, uh, we could uh, do that. I asked, I asked my question about stone degradation. That was the burning question uh, in my head. <laughs> what about you, Eames? Do you have any questions? Otherwise, I have. I think I have one question, which I think we can 
um, use and then we can wrap it up. If that's okay, Kamya. Yeah. Hmm? So I, I guess I had a okay. question for you about the about the um, the biennial and okay. you know how what how how do, how do you you know how do you navigate to what extent do you think about the, all the different ways you present photography mm. and because I you know like I was seeing some of those projections and part of me is cringing but part of me thrilled and I just wondered you know sort of a basic question and have you how how conscientious have you been about it or thought you know mindful I should say or is it something that each of the art photographers dictates I'm just curious about that because I was uh, I mean I think for us it's we are uh, most of the time we're trying to make do with what we have um mm. so um because we are a first of all a small young organization we have um uh, Arts funding is very, very limited in, in Chennai and in India in general. So we're limited by funding. We're limited by the kind of spaces we have. Um, so often actually the artists and their work um, and what their, um, you know, maybe what their requirements are or what they might want from a technical aspect um, have to be sort of like be prioritized mm. because mm. we have to tell them that, look, you know, this is, this is the most we can do. And uh, are you okay with that? And most of the time artists ob oblige and they say, yeah, okay, we'll participate. And sometimes it actually, there have been instances where artists have said, this is not going to work out. And then, you know, uh, they're just, um, we try to find another way of um, be having a, maybe a talk with them or something like that, but we don't get to show their work. Um, so the spaces that we are working with are sort of uh, um, defining how the work is presented. Um, mm -hmm. And this time, because it's hybrid, I guess it's going to be slightly um, different where it's going to be sort of like two dimensional, it, you know, a mm -hmm. website. Um, I, I know that for some of the video work that we will be showing this year, we're trying to have a room where people can come in and experience the video in person. Um, but other than that, it's going to be this sort of like mm -hmm. in your screen sort of viewing experience. <laughs> yeah, because the reason I asked is both Jack and I have the luxury privilege or whatever that at least we know how we're going to present it so even if there are adjustments that need to be made whereas you're the one who has to sort of you know have things from the beginning that are mm. that were thought of a certain way and present i just that's why i was curious it's, mm. a, it's a different it's a different animal mm. um, yeah and you, know, you know we were discussing this last week we talked about bureaucracy and things like that things can even change like you could plan mm. something and then midway through your project um it could it could completely um, um, take a, a 180 degree turn and you'll have to rethink how you plan to execute something. Mm. So that's, that's happened this to us. It's really a to fly over. Mm. Things are changing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's, I, I, that, there's a similar thing even that you have to grapple with even with displaying stuff digitally though, isn't there? Because we, we, have, to, we have to accept that people are going to look at our work on anything from the size of a small phone up to... Uh, enormous screen and we kind of you have to give up, up some of that control but I, I thought a question whilst whilst you were talking which was how do you choose the venues because they looked incredible and what's the what what, what do you look for in your venues oh we got I think we got we were very persistent with a few of the venues because once we saw them we fell in love with them and we were mm. I think dreaming about them at night mm. and you know I guess mm. similar to I think your feelings about Chimeric Stair and the flyover where we were just imagining these things at night that we're going to have a show there we're going to have a show there we would just go um, every day to this government office and sit there for hours and say please let us do this because it will be um, and it actually worked in our favor that space brought in more people than the art itself Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so people came for not just the, the the Biennale, but the fact that they were able to see this new building in their own city that has been locked up for 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. So I think for us, the element of surprise is important. We're trying to find spaces where, where people come in, they're like, wow, this is in my city. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it yet. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be able to experience that. So I think that's one of our driving factors in looking for these um, forgotten gems. Wow. And flyovers, and flyovers. Yeah. We work with the uh, flyovers and train stations and parks. A uh, lot of these, you know, public spaces that are yeah. under uh, underutilized. Yeah. Cool. cool. Um, yeah. So, Kamya, do you want to take over? Or uh, sure. So, I guess yeah. it's thirteen minutes Thank over you. time, and nobody realized. 
which is always a good sign for a dialogue session. Um, so thank you so much, Gayatri, Jack, and Eames. This was absolutely brain tickling. And uh, like I said to in the chat, for all of you in the Zoom room who still have more questions or think of a question tomorrow because the session is still ringing in your brains, please continue to ask the questions on Dara. We will keep that chat room open for the next three days. And we really encourage you to uh, flood it with questions that we're not being able to ask here. So with that, we will say good night, good afternoon and good morning from wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us. And we do hope to have more like this in the future. So. Thank you. Th th thanks for having us. And um, thank you. Hopefully some of us will rejoin in about a month or so and we'll see more. Yes. Of Please send us an email, coordinator at jaga.in. We'll be happy to invite you to our showcasing of the amazing work, artworks that are going to go under a flyover. So yeah, coordinator jaga.in to come and see us again. Cool. Thanks so Thanks, much, everyone. Jack, Thank you. Thanks, Tantika. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks, you. Gayatri. Thanks, Nikita. <laughs> Thanks, kangaroos. You all was gross and shapeshifters for uh, letting <laughs> me show your work. See, see you guys. Thank you. Good one.